Hey, good morning. Well, good afternoon. Happy Sabbath uh, to all of you. So as you can probably tell, this is a pre-recording. Uh, it is morning at the time that I am recording this, but at the time that you're re watching this, it is 1230 Eastern, at least uh, on the East Coast and certain places in the Midwest um, for the United States. So good morning, good afternoon, happy Sabbath to you. We are moving ahead in our kingdom series, and I am super excited about what the Lord has for us today. I am Pastor Lexi Johnson, and you're tuned in to Kingdom Disciples Training Center, where it is our mission to ensure that we are not only winning souls, but we are also making disciples, right? It is definitely important to get get people in the door, win the souls, right? But it is even more important to help them become the disciples that God created them to be. Why? So they can go out in the world and do what they have been called to do to advance the kingdom. So any of our announcements, you can definitely make sure to check the description or the show notes. Um, we thank you for tuning in. Whether you are watching us live or you're watching the replay, let us know who you are, where you are watching from. If you're looking for a giving opportunity, right, because one of our mandates as kingdom citizens is to give. And so if you're looking for a giving opportunity, one where you know that you're giving directly to the poor, please, again, make sure to check our um, check the description or check the show notes. We have a couple of opportunities there for you to give. You can give and uh, have monies go towards Praise Academy in um, Kenya or you can give. We still have our fundraising going along um, for Botswana. So again, check the description, click on the links for various details, and um, let's get into today's word. So again, we have been um, doing a, a series on the kingdom, and honestly speaking, all of our teachings, all of our sermons, all of our devotionals, all of our whatever, and no matter whose ministry we're in, should all be kingdom, right? Because that's the news that we're here to preach. So today um, we are talking about lost in translation, how we've watered down kingdom language, how we've watered down kingdom language. Our scripture for today is coming from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, um, verse 14. And, uh, you know, excuse me if you see me looking side to side because my notes are on the side of me today and not in front of me. So 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 14, it says, but people, I'm reading from the New Living Translation, but people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's spirit. It all sounds foolish to them and they can't understand it. For only those who are spiritual can understand what the spirit means. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we ask that your spirit be with us now, O oh Lord, that your spirit um, take over my mouth, my tongue, Lord God, that your words that you would have delivered to your people, Father God, would be delivered. Give us the boldness to confront truth, O oh Lord. Give us the clarity that we need to understand your word, O oh Lord, that we can continue to build your kingdom and expand it, advance it, Father God. That is our commission. That is what we are commissioned to do. Thank you, Father. This is our prayer. In the name of Yahusha, we pray. Amen and amen. All right. So, what if the language that we speak in our churches no longer is no longer the language of the kingdom of God? What if we've traded our divine truth for comfortable doctrines? I know it's hard for us to really uh, grasp that this may be the case, right? We know it's easy for us to look in the world and say, oh, everybody's talking about their feelings and their opinions, and that's not kingdom. 
or what if even in our own church, even some of the things that we say that sound like they are kingdom really aren't. Our scripture for today, 1 Corinthians 2.14, I read it before we got started. I actually want to read it again, and then I want to keep reading, I think, the next two or three verses after it. So again, starting at 1 Corinthians 2.14, says, but people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's spirit. It all sounds foolish to them, and they can't understand it, for only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, means. Those who are spiritual can evaluate all things, but they themselves cannot be evaluated by others. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to teach him? But we understand these things, for we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. So first of all, because we've been talking about kingdoms and what kingdoms have and what they don't have, let's talk about the importance of language in any kingdom, right? Every kingdom has its language. If you go to Britain, it has its language. If you go to the United States, okay, and its territories. It has its language. If you go to um, the islands, right, they have their official language. If you go to various parts in Africa, they have their um, official languages that they may speak for, the, or an official language they speak for that country, but then they may also have other languages that are unique to that country, right? Every kingdom has its language which is, it's not just about words, but this is about how culture is expressed. This is about, this is how values are expressed. Um, this, is, this shows you the power of that particular kingdom. So let's go to Genesis chapter 11, verses six to seven, because this is Bible study after all, right? So I pray that you have your Bibles with you, your notebooks with you, pen, Okay, or pencil or whatever your favorite writing utensil is, crayon, crayola marker, doesn't matter to me, right? And your highlighter. But let's go to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. And I'm going to read verses 6 and 7. All right, are we there? I'm going to start at first. Okay, it says, look, he said, the people are united and they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and confuse the people with different languages. Then they won't be able to understand each other. Okay, so... Here, this, of course, is the is an, an excerpt from the story of or the account of the Tower of Babel. OK, but the point here that the scripture is making is that. Unity of language in a kingdom means unity of purpose and power, unity of language. Everybody knows and understands and is clear on what the objective is means unity of purpose and power. Now in the kingdom of God, we have a language too, right? And I did a uh, Wednesday morning man on the Tower of Babel. So I don't want to, you know, dive deep off into that because the question could be, well, you know, what was so bad about them coming together to build this tower well, they were united, but they weren't united under the power and the authority of God, okay? And so unity in any way, whether it is the kingdom of God or whether it is the opposing kingdom, it is very powerful, okay? There is authority behind it. Um, let's go to Matthew chapter 12, verse 34 to 37. Matthew 12, 34 to 37. 
Matthew chapter 12, verses 34 to 37. All right. Okay. Uh, let's see. No, I was about to read 30, 24. All right, here we go. You brood of snakes, how could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. And I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. The words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. So we understand here that the language of the kingdom reflects the state of our hearts, right? This is what the scripture says. The words that we speak are a reflection of what we hold in near and dear to our hearts, the treasure of our hearts, okay? So our words are either going to, if the kingdom of God is in our hearts, our words are going to reflect that. If the kingdom of Satan is in our hearts, our words are going to reflect that, okay? This is no different from, again, when you look at these earthly kingdoms, right? If you have an allegiance to the United States, um, then when you are in conversations that, uh, you know, that will bring this to the forefront, then the words that are coming from your mouth, the words that are coming from your heart are gonna be pro-United States. If you have an allegiance for another country, same thing. This is the same thing. You can even break this um, down from countries just to even workplaces and organizations and groups, okay? Whatever you have an allegiance to, you begin, you will speak that language, all right? You will speak that language. Um, it reminds me that when you are new uh, to an organization, to a workplace, um, to a culture, right? You are trying to, when you come in first, when you first come in, things may seem a little foreign, right? The language is a little different. I remember when I first started working years ago, when I first started working at Job Corps, the language I'm telling you is a whole different language, okay? Even though this is a workplace, some workplaces may have similar languages, there the language was completely different. It was really the, the language was really based in um, military language, right? Because it kind of originated um, out of military practice. And so I had to, you know, I had to learn the language, right? So it is no different. It is no different. And so the kingdom of God has its language. And it's not just about the words that are said, but it's also about the power and the authority behind the words, okay? If you are a part of a certain organization, the words, the language that you learn to speak shows your allegiance to that organization, but also people can tell the power and the authority from which you speak, okay? I don't care if it's McDonald's. I don't care if it's, um, I don't know, the uh, electric company, wherever you are. Every group has its language. And so when you begin to speak, people know that, okay, you're a part of that organization and you are speaking by the power and the authority of that organization, okay? The same is true for the kingdom of God. And so in the scripture here in Matthew chapter 12, verse 37, he says the words, the writer says the words you say will either acquit you or they are going to condemn you. What is he talking about? So first of all, that word acquit means to exonerate. It means to absolve. It means to hold guiltless, right? And so therefore condemn means the opposite of that. It means that you are going to be found guilty, right? 
you are not absolved. You are not exonerated. You are not free. So they're going to acquit you or condemn you. And what, and as we talk about the kingdom of God, he is saying the words that we speak are either going to show that we are part of the kingdom of God, or they're going to show that we are not part of the kingdom of God. Okay. The language of the kingdom reflects the state of our hearts. It reflects our allegiance to God's rule. How loyal are we to the kingdom? And are we suitable for the kingdom? Are we suitable for its good works? Are we suitable to speak by the power and the authority of the kingdom? And there is no in-between, right? And in our, <laughs> in our world, too many people are walking around speaking and acting like there is an in-between. What do I mean? Most people are talking about their opinions. Most people are talking about what they feel. Most people are talking about, well, my uh, understanding, my, you know, in a way that says that whatever they think is superior to the giver of the word and what he was thinking or speaking, right? The word can clearly say that this action is condemned, but there are people in the world who say, well, in my opinion, it's not that bad. I don't think it's a sin. Society doesn't think it's a sin. So therefore it's not a sin, right? And then some of us who say that we are kingdom believers will be like, will, will, will ascribe to that belief. And so then we begin to speak like this foreign culture and we are no longer speaking like kingdom citizens. So we have to understand that every word that comes from our mouth reflects the state of our hearts. Every word that comes from our mouth shows whether we have an allegiance to God or whether we have an allegiance to Satan. There is no in-between. I need us to understand that, okay? There is no in-between. So the problem with modern Christian language, Christian, okay? I <laughs> will say not kingdom. The problem is, because you have to understand, unfortunately, these days, Christian doesn't also synonymously mean, um, or Christian is not synonymous for kingdom either. Church is not synonymous for kingdom, unfortunately, okay? But the problem with our modern language is that over time, it has been diluted by worldly doctrines. It has been diluted by traditions. It has been diluted by practices that focus more on um, human understanding, right? And less on the spiritual truth of the word of God. Let's go to Mark uh, chapter seven, verse 13. Mark chapter seven, verse 13. Mark chapter seven, verse 13. And it says, and so you cancel the word of God in order to hand down your own tradition. And this is only one example among many others. So of course the writer here, if you read in context, has already given an example of what he meant, right? Um, and so this whole chapter in Matthew, well, the beginning of Matthew chapter seven, Yahush is talking about inner purity. He is um, the, the Pharisees, right? And the teachers of the religious law uh, have come to check him out. And what they noticed was that the disciples failed to follow some kind of ritual. And so they call Yahusha on it, right? 
And so he responds by saying, and so you cancel the word of God in order to hand down your own traditions. In other words, your tradition has become way more important than the word of God. We see this happening right in our very own churches, that traditions have become more important than the word of God. Anytime you find yourself, and I think I made, have made mention to this uh, last week for another reason and maybe in other uh, messages that I have taught, but when the, the people of <laughs> supposedly the kingdom, the people of the church begin to argue about the color of carpets, um, the time of a service, um, the, 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 the robes, the style of robes <laughs> that one should wear, all of these things. And I'm saying these little things, but there are even uh, other things that some may think, you know, are a bigger deal that we're arguing over. And we're saying, no, it has to be this way because it's always been this way. Service has to be at 11 because it's always been at 11. Um, we can't do Sabbath school or Sunday school at this time because it's always been at this time. We've always done the baptism ceremony on this particular weekend at this particular time. Then the traditions have taken precedent over or have now become superior to God's word. Because see, in the kingdom, none of that matters. None of that matters. There is no expressed command or rule about um, church needs to be held at this time, right? There is no express command for that. And if you want to take that even deeper, there is no express command for it because <laughs> Really, if we look at the word church and what it actually means, it really should transform the way we're doing church. I'm not going to go there today, right? So what are some other examples, though, of what we're talking about that things have over time, they have become lost in translation. Over time, things have become watered down, right? Um, over time, traditions and doctrines have replaced the pure word of God, right? And when you replace tradition with the word of God, then it leads to watered down language as well. And then that word lacks power. And then because that word lacks power, guess what? People are not becoming free. And if people are not becoming free, then what does that mean? That their eternity is in jeopardy. So here's some examples, right, of some watered down language. When we say blessings, we mean it as material things, material wealth, right? Every time we talk about, oh, God blessed me to get a new house, a new car, a new job, a new thing. That's what we mean when we say blessing. But the truth is that blessings in the kingdom are spiritual and they are eternal. Blessing is God empowering you to do his work. Blessing is him making you suitable for his good works. Blessing is him um, preparing you, right, to do his good work. Blessing is the spiritual gifts that he is giving you so you can do his good work. It's not merely receive you know receiving getting a house or getting a car or getting a, what how is how is it a blessing if it's not something that's going to be used for the kingdom how is it a blessing if it's something that is just for you to boast about Bo um something that has been gotten out of selfish ambition selfish ambition um boasting right of your own that's not kingdom so we have watered down that word. Um, favor is another word that we have watered down, right? We speak of favor as something that we earn for good behavior. But the truth is, it's an unmerited grace. What does is, what is unmerited mean? 
that there's nothing that you can do. You can do all of the works in the world, but that doesn't mean all of, you know, that doesn't mean you get more favor because you do more works, right? It is an unmerited grace that comes from God. Faith is also, believe it or not, a watered down word. Why? Because we talk about faith as if it's just this mere belief system. My faith, right? I am of the apostolic faith. I am of the Adventist faith. I am of the whatever faith. And it's like, faith is not some mere belief system, right? Faith is actually how you, how you live and it is active trust, right? It, faith moves mountains. Faith is the currency of the kingdom. So it's not just mere belief, but it is belief that is coupled with works, okay? And again, not works because you're trying to climb the ladder of the kingdom. No, works because I believe. These works are a demonstration of my belief in God. My belief in the, uh, my belief in Yahusha and my belief in him and his ability and his power and what he can do in my life and the life of others, right? So that word faith, water down. And it is our responsibility as kingdom citizens to make sure that these words do not get lost in translation. Love is another that has been lost in translation especially today, we talk about, oh, you know, we just need to love. And we have no idea what that means. And the love that we are demonstrating are, is not love from 1 Corinthians 13. Have you read 1 Corinthians 13? Like, have you not just read through it, meditate on it, right? Meditate. The word for meditate in the Hebrew, is it the Hebrew or Greek? It's the Hebrew, I think, is haga. And haga means like you're just tearing into it, right? If you've ever seen lions eat or lion cubs eat, that's how we need to be meditating on the word of God. Have you meditated on 1 Corinthians 13? And can you truly say that that is how we are expressing love in the world? 1 Corinthians 13 is the true expression of love. But when we look at what's going on and how we use the word love and when we say we love, we can look at that and say, that that's not what I'm doing. At least I can't speak for you, right? But I remember one day just really, because I was preparing to speak on that um, particular scripture, that particular topic of love. And I remember just reading it and meditate on it, meditating on it, and then crying and asking God for forgiveness because this is not the way in which I, I was expressing love. Right? It has been watered down. Marriage, watered down. Um, the word adultery, watered down, because now we say instead of adultery would say having an affair. Like we take these words and then we just want to find something more palatable or something more easy to digest instead of calling it for what it is, right? Forgiveness. What we water it down. Um, even phrases that we have, right? Because these phrases are a part of language. And so People will say, all you have to do is accept, uh, accept Yahusha, and that's it. That's the beginning. Your yes to Yahusha is the beginning. We will say it is free. No, it's not. Salvation is, not. yes, you take the gift of salvation, but there is a cost. You cannot say yes to Yahusha. And remain the way that you are. You cannot say yes and not be on a journey of becoming sanctified, of becoming pure, of becoming holy, of becoming. You can't do that. Can you come as you are? Yes. Can you remain as you are? 
No, because if you are truly living by the word of God, the word of God has power, it is living, and it transforms. Now, I want to go back to something real quick because it reminds me in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 14, our main scripture, it says, but people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's spirit. That word spirit, it's another word that's probably been, not probably, has been watered down, but that word spirit means breath. Okay. In the Greek, it means breath. Pneuma, okay, breath. That word spirit also means mind. But people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's mind, from God's breath. Okay, why? Because they do not have God's mind and God's breath. And how is it that we are able to have, and we can't have God's mind in his entirety, but how then do we begin to be able to think like uh, Yahusha and move like Yahusha? It is because of the Holy Spirit, God's breath, that we allow to indwell in us to dwell within us, right? God's spirit that we allow to govern us without God's breath. Without God's breath, we cannot understand his word. Without his spirit, his Holy Spirit, we cannot understand his word. So that is why when we get into the word of God, we can't just read it just for the sake of reading. You can't just open it up, start reading and think you're going to understand. No, you have to be one who is open to the Holy Spirit, allows the Holy Spirit to fill you. And this is why people who are not of the kingdom cannot understand God's word. It can be plain as day. We're reading it. It's very plain but it is not plain to them. The word says that it is foolishness to them. But again, same thing. That that shouldn't be um that shouldn't be something hard for us to understand. If I walk into a workplace and it has its own language and I walk in there as a foreigner, I'm not going to understand it. To them it's plain. Everything that they're saying is plain. They get it. It's understandable. They're on one accord. They're moving to and fro. One purpose, unified. I'm standing there like, I have no idea what's going on here. No idea. In fact, you can even go from one region in the U.S. to the next region, right? And not understand the language and be lost. I remember for the very first time when I visited the South, Talk about not understanding the way they speak, not understanding language. And I had to look at my husband then at that time and be like, can you translate? Because that's his family. That's where he's from, right? I could not understand, right? And so that's how people who are not of the kingdom, who don't believe the word of God, that's how it is. We can come to them with scripture all day long, but it's just going to sound like it's just going to be foreign foolishness to them. It's going to sound like uh, uh, those of you dating myself now, you just watch Charlie Brown and the teacher and Charlie Brown. Every time Charlie Brown called the teacher on the phone, it would just be like, wah, 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 wah. we didn't understand. And Charlie Brown's like, yep. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We like, what in the world is the lady saying? We don't know. <laughs> right. That's how it sounds. That's how it sounds. And so this is why our approach has to be different. When we are talking to people who are not believers, we feel like we can take this book and just go start talking to people who don't even believe in this book. They don't even understand this book. And we think that we're just going to talk from this book and they're going to understand it. No, they're not. The scripture clearly tells us spiritual things are spiritually discerned. 
So unless they have the breath of God, the mind of God, what is the breath and mind of God? The Holy Spirit. Unless they have the Holy Spirit, that it, it is foolishness to them. And dare I say that not only is it that a does that apply to foreigners? But that even applies to many of us who have been in church for a million years and still do not understand the word of God. We are a foreigner just the same because we have not allowed the Holy Spirit to be the one to interpret the word of God. And so we're lost in translation as well. Those of us who call ourselves part of the kingdom of God, we're lost in translation too because we are not allowing the Holy Spirit to interpret. We are allowing our feelings, our emotions, our mind, our everything else, our, just our whole tinted life to interpret the word of God. Do you have the breath of God? Do you have the spirit of God? The language of the kingdom has been hijacked, if you will, right, by religious institutions, shifting the focus from living a living relationship with God to rituals and to dogma. Man's doctrine, man's teachings have become more important than the word of God. We quote from man's doctrines and man's teachings. There are, there are sayings that church folk have that are nowhere in the Bible. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5 says, they will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. They act religious. And see, we have to understand that religious and godly are not the same thing. Religion and the kingdom are not the same thing. They're not the same thing. Church, not synonymous. <laughs> In these days, the way we practice church is not, this, is not synonymous with kingdom. So they act religious but they reject the power that can make them godly. When I when I when I read that verse, one of the first things that came to mind is fasting. Fasting is so powerful. But do you know that many people are not truly experiencing the power of fasting because it has been watered down. It has just become a ritual. So people think, "Oh, okay, time to fast." I just don't eat for a period of time and that's it. And it's like, that's not it. There are, while you are fasting, there are things that you are supposed to be doing. You are supposed to be feasting on the word of God during that time. It's not merely just not eating and you just go on about your day. There is no power in that. There can be no power that comes from that. But a lot of people don't even know the biblical way to fast. Because we just say we're not going to eat from a certain time to a certain time, or we're just, we're only going to eat one meal a day or whatever it is. And that's it. We don't, we don't teach people how to get into the word of God. We don't teach people how to take that time that they are fasting, get in the word of God, uh, increase their prayer life, increase their meditation life, right? How to listen for God, that is the purpose of fasting. The the just setting down the meal is like the bare bottom minimum. It has been watered down, and so therefore people fast and they don't see any results. They don't see any transformation. Why? Where where is the power and the authority? Where is the numa? Where is the breath of God? Breath of God is not in that. And if the breath of God is not in it, 
then the power and the authority of God is not behind it. And if the power and authority of God is not behind it, then there can be no transformation. Not transformation that makes you more godly. Because mind you, you're either on a process of transformation to being more godly, or you are in a process of transformation to being more like Satan. There is no middle ground. And the words that you are using and speaking, our, our, our main scripture said every idle word, every word that we think lays dormant, every word that we think like we're very lazy people when it comes to language because there are certain words that we think just, you know, don't have a lot of power like a or the or, you know, these types of words. And when we read in the Bible, we just run over those words. But in the Bible, every word, every word, every word has power and authority behind it. And that's why we get lost in translation because we're skipping over words, we're hurrying along and we get lost. And we don't experience the true power of the kingdom. So the language of the kingdom has become more about outward appearance, really, than less about inward transformation. We are more concerned with what, you know, we we take communion every first whatever Sunday of the month. We fast every third Monday. We all of these things. We say we do. We speak about them, but they have no power and authority in them. Why? Because really it's all about just what we look like. And it's not about what is happening on the inside of us. Because that's where the change has to occur first. You can change the outside of how you look. Anybody can change the outside of how they look easily. Today, today, in the next few minutes, I can go shave this hair off. I can, you know, move the glasses. I can put on makeup. I can do all kinds of things to change my outward appearance. But it would, it does nothing to change me inside. And that's what happens when we hold traditions, when we hold man's doctrine above the word of God. Having a form of godliness, right? A form of godliness, but not the true godliness. This is the importance of knowing, understanding the word of God and understanding that every word matters in the kingdom of God. Every word matters. Every word matters. Okay. So, also, in some cases, the word of God has been used to manipulate and control people. That's called witchcraft. And rather than allow people to live in freedom and dominion to God, because that's the way God has it, Genesis 128, right? We are not to oppress and rule and, and, and step on, stomp over uh, people, hold them down. That's not what we're called to do. We are called to encourage people to live in the freedom and the dominion that God has given them to live in, to, to, to know what their God given abilities and talents are and to use them. But instead, what do we do? You will find that there are humans who will keep people from becoming all that God will have them to be. They will withhold from them. They don't want to train them. They don't want to whatever, right? Or some of us as quote unquote church leaders, you know, oh no, it's not your time yet. Oh no, it's not your time yet. And this, and you telling them that has nothing to do with God saying that to you. That's coming from your own place, because your own insecurities because you're afraid that if you let this person go, they're going to take over. 
or you don't want the person to, maybe you'll let them do things in your space, right? But you don't want them to take those gifts and abilities and be a blessing somewhere else. Last week, I talked about the problem with membership because we think that the people are ours and it's not, they're not. Who are we? So in some cases, people have taken the word of God and they've manipulated it so that they can control people. And that's not good. Galatians 1, chapter 6. I'm sorry. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Galatians 1, verse 6 and 7 says, I am shocked that you are turning away so soon from God who called you to himself through the loving mercy of Christ. You are following a different way that pretends to be the good news, but it's not the good news at all. You are being fooled by those who deliberately twist the truth concerning Yahusha. So we must also be vigilant, right? We cannot, those of us who may not hold titles of pastor, preacher, teacher, evangelism, father, evangelist, father, whoever, we cannot hold to the excuse that, oh, well, so-and-so didn't let me. So-and-so said, I wasn't ready. Did God say you were ready? And I'm saying that God truly said it, right? I'm not saying that you are not listening to God and you're not listening to godly counsel. That's not the situation I'm talking about, okay? I'm talking about people who have clearly heard from God that they need to move out of a space into another space and do some things, but you will not because a man told you not to. Right? The author here in Galatians says that you are following a different way that pretends to be the good news, but it's not the good news at all. That you are being fooled by those who deliberately twist the truth concerning Yahusha. The true language of the kingdom is meant to liberate. The true language of the kingdom does not bind, does not hold in bondage, does not deceive, does not oppress. That doesn't mean that the language is always nice and you're going to hear what you want to hear all the time either. Because sometimes the very thing you don't want to hear is the very thing that will free you. Because that's what the word of God does. It liberates. So what is the language of the kingdom of God? What is the language of the kingdom of God? The language of the kingdom of God is not about religious jargon. Because that's what happens when we, you know, in a workplace, they got terminology that, you know, jargon that is specific to them. And that's what we've done here on earth with these churches is now that we are churchy and we have this language that is just religious jargon and it is not the word of God. Okay. But the word of God, the language of the kingdom is about speaking with authority and power. Whose power and authority? God's power and authority. It's about speaking the truth of God, not our truth as we see it or our truth as we think or our truth is in our opinion, because in the kingdom, this is not a democracy in the kingdom. And that's why I think we in the United States have such a hard time with being believers, being kingdom citizens. Because we don't understand anything outside of democracy. We think we can say whatever we want and have a say. No. God is the king of kings. He is the father. Yahushua is the king. <laughs> That's it. It, the, it is the will of the father that is to be done. That is it. That is all. And we are, if we say yes to being part of the kingdom, then we understand that along with that yes is our the relinquishing of our will. For his. 
John 6, 63. John 6, 63. Because how do we restore the pure language of the kingdom? John 6, 63 says the spirit alone gives eternal life. Spirit with a capital S meaning the Holy Spirit because there are other spirits. Okay. There's the Holy Spirit of God. And then there are spirits of the enemy. So the spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit alone gives eternal life. The Holy Spirit alone. So it's not the Holy Spirit in you. It's not the Holy Spirit in me. It is not the Holy Spirit in the church board. It is not the Holy Spirit in the elders. It is not the Holy Spirit. And it's not. It is the Holy Spirit alone who gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words I have spoken to you are spirit, right? Their breath, right? And life. The language of the kingdom is life giving, it is spirit led, it is rooted in the truth of God's word. What are the words that are coming out of your mouth? Are they life giving? Even when you have to confront someone, even when you have to rebuke someone, are your words life giving? Because you can rebuke someone, you can confront someone and still give life. I'm going to say it again. You can rebuke someone, you can confront someone and still give life. Ephesians 4, verse 25. Ephesians 4, verse 25 says, so stop telling lies. <laughs> Let us tell our neighbors the truth. For we are all parts of the same body. So these are the characteristics of kingdom language. It is truth, first and foremost. Most, most, <laughs> first and foremost, it is truth. Okay? Or I shouldn't say first and foremost. These are just simply the characteristics, right? The word of God is truth. So if it's anything other then it is not kingdom language. You are not speaking kingdom language. And if you ain't speaking kingdom language, then you can't be part of this culture. It is power. First Corinthians four, verse 20, for the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk. It is living by God's power. Listen, if you have been part of a, or just, you know, have watched an organization, they have all these meetings, they do all this talking, 25 years have passed by, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. Have you ever been a part of an organization, seen an organization or a church or a workplace or whatever? 30 years have gone by. All these meetings, all of this talking, nothing has changed. Same for individuals. And be mindful, is this you? All of this talking that you do, all of these phrases that you, you know, these churchy phrases and things that you use, all of this talking that you have been doing for 50 years and there has been no transformation. It's a problem because there is power in God's word. Another characteristic of the kingdom language Authority. Not only is there power, not only is it truth, but there is authority. Luke 10 verse 19 says, look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them and nothing will injure you. So there is an authority that you have when you speak the word of God. But if you are not speaking the word of God, it is going to be evident because you'll have no authority. You can even have worldly authority. You can be given worldly titles. Walk around, you got worldly authority. But the true test is, do you have kingdom authority? Another characteristic, love. And if there had to be one that is... 
I would say foundational, it is this. 1 Corinthians 13, 1. I spoke about 1 Corinthians 13 earlier. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Anytime, whatever you are speaking is not from a place of love. And this has nothing to do with whether you're firmly speaking or whether it's friendlier or it has nothing to do with that tone. It's just, is it coming from a place of love? Because if it's not coming from a place of love, it is not kingdom language. If it's coming from vengeance and greed or anything that is not of God, you're speaking to someone, calling yourself, putting them in their place or helping them to be better, but it's not coming from a place of love. Noisy gong or a clang, clanging cymbal. Truth, power, authority, love. Those are the characteristics of kingdom language. And when that is in place, when all of that is in place, then you're going to see transformation. It, it's, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Transformation must happen. It has to happen. It is inevitable. So as we conclude, this is what I want to call you to do. I want you to reflect on the language that you use in your daily walk, in your daily life? Are your words aligned with the true language of the kingdom or have they been tainted? Have they been watered down by doctrine and traditions? And be honest, because again, there can't be any transformation without truth. I know I can do a better job of making sure that every word that comes out of my mouth reflects the kingdom of God. If I say I am a kingdom citizen, my language needs to reflect that. And you all know that I love to also give you practical application, right? I want to teach and just have things remain like theoretical. So here is the practical application. Start using scripture-based language, not cliches and things that are man-made, scripture-based language. And the only way that you're going to be able to do that is to do what? To get into the scriptures and to be in them regularly, right? When you walk to a workplace and the language is foreign to you, how do you then begin to learn that language? You have to immerse yourself in that place. You can't just go every now and then right? You have to immerse yourself in it and eventually begin to speak the language. So you immerse yourself in the word of God. So now everything you, you, it, that you speak is scripture based. Your prayers are scripture based. You are praying scriptures, not just praying your own words. Your prayers are scripture based. Your conversations with people are scripture based. When they're asking you for advice in that, they're scripture based. Your teachings are scripture based right? That is the practical application. So let's ask God to purify our language and to align our words with his kingdom truth. Let us pray. Father, align our words with your kingdom truth. Fill us with your spirit, with your pneuma, with your breath, your Holy Spirit, that we may have the mind to speak, not according to our words, but to your words, so that there is true power, authority, and transformation. This is our prayer. In the name of Yahushua, we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you, uh, and we'll see you next time.